thank you. It's really good to be here. Thank you, Paula. I want you to give me a hug. <laughs> no, it's really, really happy uh, to be here. And can I just send my huge love and hugs to Ellen Clifford as well? I look forward to hanging out with you again really soon. And yeah. I've just come. Oh, hi, hey, Roger. All right, we'll pass that on. Please do. Um, apologies, I'm late. I was just at uh, speaking at another fringe meeting on. Uh, ending the hostile environment, um, talking about obviously what this awful government uh, has done in terms of uh, disabled people and, you know, listening to people's experiences, you never kind of tire of, of the experiences of what people are actually going through and just that, that conscious cruelty that they have done to, to, to so many of us. So, you know, today, piss on pity, I mean, <laughs> disability oppression is, you know, we do need to talk about this because I wasn't going to share this, but I think I might just do a little speech and just, just kind of really talk about my experience um, recently and because it is an element of disability oppression and, you know, and until society and the institutions are, are going to understand disability, we will not make any progress. We've had decades of campaigning, and I say this always, that you know I'm standing on the shoulders of many disability activists and, and supporters that have went before me in campaigning to ensure we had some rights and protections, to ensure we had an element of independent living that has now been taken away practically. To ensure that there was some legislation, although, you know, the legislation for disabled people in the form of what was the Disability Discrimination Act, it didn't have the same parity as the Race Relations Act. And that, you know, why was that? Why was it not a crime to discriminate against a disabled person? But you could, it is, if you're black or brown. You know, and it, that to me is just the embodiment of, of oppression. But I talk about it in the context of being an elected MP and so many activists like Paula and others, Roger, so many people came and really helped me fight to win that seat and we overturned a Tory majority of 8,000 yeah. and elected me. Yeah. 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 I never tire of that and I never forget that and I remember that each and every time I'm in that building. But this year, has been a challenge because as a disabled MP, I should have the right support and reasonable adjustments need to be made. And the organization, the independent body that supports all MPs, it's all 650 of us, made some decisions where they refused to support me with the extra costs that I have in terms of printing. It may sound small, but you know, I have to print things in really large font, which means I use a lot more paper and a lot more ink than my non-disabled colleagues. And they just wouldn't accept that. Well, actually, they, they, they actually did say, yeah, we know you might have extra costs, but we're not going to meet those costs. That blatant discrimination. And they thought that it was okay to treat somebody like that. And you have to then fight them quite literally, you know, really have a to and fro with them. And it wasn't until I stood in the chamber on International Women's Day this year and raised that issue that they finally decided to have a chat with me and wanting to look at solutions. Should it have taken that? No. No, of course it shouldn't have. I was appointed the Shadow Minister for Disabled People back in 2017. And I was really, you know, Jeremy's asked me to serve and I wanted to do that and so I accepted it. But I knew that to do that role and give that role the, the time, the investment and the work that it required, I would need extra support to do the job. So I asked this, the to sorry, whether they would support me with an additional staff member to do this job. And they asked for some sort of proof or evidence and so a letter was provided to them by the parliamentary 
uh, Health Occupational Health Service that stated that due to my disability and my shadow ministerial responsibilities, I would require that extra support. So Ipsa then approved that support, which was wonderful. I was able to recruit somebody to support me in the brief as the shadow minister. And as we know, because we have a very hostile government, holding them to account does require a lot of work and effort. You know, I've had so many points of orders and urgent questions against this government granted to me. So I'm, I was pleased to be holding them to account and keeping them on their toes. But then this year, Ipsa decided that they made an error in providing that staffer and they were taking it away. So I then had to lose that staff member. And for me, we talk about oppression, and that is oppression, because my job is to be an elected member of parliament for the people of Battersea, whom I serve with all my heart and soul and might, but I have an additional role and responsibility that required that additional support. Now, we're in the process of trying to work out some solutions, but I shouldn't have been oppressed and put through what they have put me through. They have caused me much worry, anxiety, stress, tears. My sighted assistant, Sarita, is here at the back there, and, you know, she witnessed most, most of it because she shares an office with me. But I say that, and I, and I, and I wasn't intending to share that, but I just think it's important to understand that, you know, we're in 2019 and disabled people still do not have the same equal parity as everybody else. And we have to fight, continue to fight, to ensure that the labor movement, the trade union movement, all come together with us as activists, with DPAC and others, to ensure that we can create that society that is fair, compassionate, just and equal. Because 10 years of austerity has led to what the UN have called a systematic violation of the rights of disabled people. The UN reporter in his 2019 report likened the Department for Work and Pensions to a 19th century workhouse. This is a stain on society and we all know that disabled people have been hardest hit by much of austerity. And it's not just in social security, it's in the labour market, it is in housing, and probably worst of all, it's in social care. Now I only say social care because that's what we all know it as, but really it should be independent living, because it's just about us being able to independently live <laughs> and participate in society. So if we want to go out and campaign, and do direct action caller. <laughs> we should be able to do that. You know, we have a labour market now where the disability employment gap has remained at just over 30%. Why is that? We need to change those attitudes and people's mindsets. You know, labour are committed to the social model of disability. And again, we pay tribute to those disabled people, their carers, their partners, their spouses, that fought to, to actually ensure that it's not us that are the problem, it's society, those barriers that disable us. Yes, we have an impairment, mine is my stagmus, so I have an involuntary movement of the eye which causes me to be severely visually impaired. But it's society, I can't just walk out of this building and walk up those steps on my own, I have to hold on to, to my assistant. I can't navigate this party conference on my own, it's society and that's what we need to change. Now, I believe going forward under a Labour government led by Jeremy Corbyn, we can achieve much of this. It won't happen overnight, we all know this. But step by step, I believe we can actually create that transformative society that we so, as disabled people, we hunger, we desire and absolutely need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.